Hello, this is the solutions for Math 2413 sample problems for exam one. So what I'm going to do, go through here is without working them out in detail, which I already have the work shown, I'm going to verbally explain the process to help give you some guidance on seeing what happened here. All right, for the first one, we're looking at the limit of this function as x approaches negative one. So if it exists, we're looking to see does it approach the same y value from both sides? The key word being approach. Because you see this, this dot down here represents the function value. So yeah, there's f of negative 1 would be right here at negative 2. But let's look at what it's approaching. See where I have to draw these arrows? It's approaching that hole. And that hole is at positive 2, so that would be the limit. If it approached two different locations, the limit would not exist unless you were talking about one-sided limits. Just like this one, number two, x approaches zero because they are approaching two different values from two different directions. That limit does not exist. Now here is, is finding a, a limit using a table of values. Basically there's three ways. Limit is table of values. Um, looking at a graph like we've done, and then possibly analytical, algebraic, algebraic ways to do them. So this one shows that, notice that we're looking at zero, so this chart has values on both sides of zero. And you see it's approaching negative four from both sides as it gets close to zero, it's approaching negative four. So the limit for this would be negative four. Actually, this problem is a little bit strange now that I look at it, because generally the only time you would uh, do it this way is if you're looking at being the, the function being undefined at zero. But this problem can be solved by just plugging zero in there, because you'd get eight divided by negative two, which is negative four. But that's okay. This is it shows a, a use of the chart. That's fine. But that's not where you would normally see this. Normally, you would see it when you have a divide by zero scenario. Because the first rule of thumb on any kind of limit of a, of a function is, is if you can plug a number in there for x and get a value for y, which is the same way you would get the function value, if that exists, then that's going to be your limit also. Like this one's very straightforward. Take negative 2, plug it in there everywhere there's an x, go through there, Calculates out to be negative 87. That's pretty straightforward. Now this one, limit of sine of x of x, or divided by x as x goes to pi over 2. Now you got to be careful. A lot of times people will, uh, there's that property that says when the limit of x goes to 0 of sine of x over x. That does equal 1. So a lot of times uh, people will see sine of x over x and immediately go, oh, that's 1, no matter what. Well, actually it isn't. You got to check to see what it's approaching. This one would just be sine of pi over 2 is 1. Divided by pi over 2 would make that limit be 2 over pi. So always make sure you see what the value is approaching. Now this technique, illustrated in my notes, for the more complicated one, this is a complex fraction. Uh, what you want to do here is you want to get this thing into uh, a single fraction. So first thing you do, we'll plug the number in, you'll see that you'll get 0 over 0. Yeah, that's the first thing. And, uh, and if you get non-zero over zero, it won't exist. If you get zero over zero, it may or may not exist. You have to kind of take it further from there. But algebraically, I would you have a 2 and an x up here, so your LCM is 2x. So I multiply top and bottom by 2x, but notice I don't distribute on the bottom. I don't want that to distribute because I want this x minus 2 to cancel because that's when I plug 2 in, I get zero. So when you put 2x times x will give you 2. 2x divided by 2 is x. So actually 2 minus x divided by x minus 2 does cancel, but it cancels to negative 1. So that's, that gets rid of it. And then you have negative 1 over 2x. Then you reinsert the value of 2 here for x, and that will give you negative 1 over 4. Now the next one um, with radicals, you need to conjugate top and bottom 
doing this algebraically. Top and bottom by the conjugate, which is the opposite sign between the two, wherever the radical is. If the radical is on the bottom, that would dictate what the conjugate is. So the conjugate of the square root of x minus 3 would be the square root of x plus 3. So you got to do the same thing top and bottom to look like you're multiplying you know, by 1, which you are. And on the top, that's going to give you x minus 9 if you multiply that out. Uh, and that leaves, see, notice I did not multiply those two things out in the bottom. You never want to do that because you need to leave, the, leave it intact because the whole plan is something's supposed to cancel. And if you distribute it, you'll create a big mess. Well, look what we have here. The x minus 9s will cancel. Then you have 1 over the square root of x plus 3. Reinsert the 9. That gives you 1 over 3 plus 3, which is 1 over 6. Number 8. Um, this one, you get 0 over 0, and this is just a straight up uh, factor and cancel problem. Didn't have to do any weird conjugates or, or, or complex fractions. So the bottom will factor into x minus 3, x minus 1, and here's a little hint. You know, anytime it's 0 over 0, the idea is one of the factors is, is going to be whatever makes it be zero when you plug in the three. In other words, so, you know, x minus three would produce zero when you put three in there, so there's a good chance that that was going to be the one of the two factors. But you don't have to know that. So see the x, so two comes out top, x minus three is cancel, then you have two over x minus one, two divided by two is one. There you go. Now this one, I, I put a graph down here, but you could use that chart of values. And actually, you don't really need an entire chart. You could just put in, you know, like negative 0 0.001 and positive 0 0.001. And you could clearly tell from here that uh, one of them is going to be positive 1 coming from the left and, and, and negative 1 coming from the right. You see, so those don't converge on the same value, therefore it does not exist. But if we're talking one-sided limits, then each of the, the one-sided limits would exist, but not what we call the, well, the regular limit, for lack of a better term, but dual-sided limit or whatever you want to call it. This one looks really complicated, but it's not. It's kind of using basic properties of limits. So if you have a multiple, the limit can, you know, unlike other types of functions, you've got to be careful. You can't do this with trig functions and stuff like that, or logarithms. That actually does distribute through there, so uh, that's the same thing as saying negative 8 times limit of x to the negative 9 of f of x. And you see it gives you those values, so all you're doing is just inserting those values. In other words, f of x doesn't equal negative 5, but limit of x goes to negative 9 equals negative 5 of f of, of f of x. So you just plug those values in there, negative 5, negative 7, gets 54 over negative 16 which reduces to negative 27 over 8. Now this one, you plug in 0, you get 0 over 0. So there's a chance that it might exist. Although the last problem was one of the, not this one, sorry, number uh, 9. You know, you get 0 over 0, that does not exist. So not all 0 over zeros will exist, but many of them will. More so, way more so than not. All right, so what I did here is, uh, I, I rewrote tan as sine over cosine, flipped it over, dividing by a fraction, flips it over, gives me a cosine. And on top and sine on bottom. So I wanted to use that identity limit of sine of x over x goes to 1 as x goes to 0. And my notes show that actually it doesn't have to be just x over x. It can be, as long as it like sine of 7x over 7x. As long as they're the same coefficient, that will also go to 1. So what I did is I put a 7 theta here, 7 theta, top and bottom, to multiply by 1, because my intention is to pair up the sine of 7 theta on top with the 7 theta on bottom, like I did right here. Limits, you can rearrange that around. Limits, we have a lot more flexibility than we do with derivatives. And so then sine of 7 theta goes with theta. That goes with 1. And then I have a theta on top with a sine of theta on bottom, which my notes also show that that result is still 1, even if it's the, if it's the reciprocal, basically because 1 over 1 is 1. 
So that leaves a seven dangling out here by itself, which is right there, and a cosine by itself. So you put in zero, so cosine of zero is one, seven multiple in front, that makes an a, a answer seven. Now this next one, you have to be careful. All depends on how many, whether you have more signs on top than you do on the bottom. So it, if theta on bottom was the same as power sine on top, they'd all pair up. So you have a sine theta with a say, theta, that leaves a sine theta by itself with that two-thirds. But since this is zero, when you put zero in there for theta, two-thirds times zero would be zero. If this had been theta squared on the bottom, we would have had another sine theta over theta. That would have also been one, and then the answer would have been two-thirds. Because the thetas would have paired up. All right. Here's some one, there's a one-sided limit. So obviously we have to know the direction based on those superscripts. When the superscript is a negative, that means left to right. So it's approaching that hole. That hole is at negative two, so that's your first answer. One plus coming from the right down is, is approaching at negative seven. So that's what the first answer, negative two. The second answer is negative seven. Then, of course, the, the regular limit going to negative one would not exist because those two are not matching. But individually, they do. Come down here. All right. Now, finding a, a limit from a piecewise function, one-sided limit like this is, is determine, you know, the plus or minus. And basically, it's picking, you know, you're going to plug 7 into one of these two halves. You just have to decide which half to plug it into. Obviously, that'll make a difference between getting it right or wrong. Now, don't let the direction of that arrow fool you because that just says when values are greater than 7, plus means you are approaching the limit from values of 7. So is it, even though it's greater than or equal to 7, you're coming from numbers larger than 7 into the left like this. So that means that representation would represent the bottom greater than or equal to 7. The top would be coming from the left. If it had been the minus sign here, I'd have plugged 7 in the top, but because it's the uh, plus, means it's coming from values larger than 7, so you just plug 7 in there. So as long as you know which one of these two to plug it into, it's a very easy question. Uh, it's 10. Yeah, and I noticed that the uh, negative 19, that would be the other answer if it was coming from the left. All right, now, one-sided limits, uh, we're going to consider infinity as an answer for these. Uh, regular two-sided limits, I just like to use do not exist and not worry about infinity. But one-sided limits, we, we will consider in you infinity as an, an answer. So here, uh, ne approaching negative 1 from the left with the negative. So all we have to do is pick a test value just slightly. You know, make sure it's on the correct side of negative 1. I'll put several values in here. You could also graph this if you wanted to and look at it. That would be perfectly fine. Um, and see what it's doing. That might be better than this, actually. So, but anyway, so I picked values on the left of negative 1. You see they get, they're getting closer to negative 1. They're coming from the left, and they're just getting massively, massively positive. So obviously, if I had put the graph in here at negative 1, it would be doing this. Going way straight up like that. And then you would have an asymptote right here at negative 1. So it's definitely approaching positive infinity. So that's definitely, so that's the correct answer. But yeah, you can, if you graph in the calculator, that's fine too. Okay. Number 16. Secant at pi over 2 is undefined because 1 over, uh, secant is 1 over cosine and cosine at pi over 2 is 0. But that's certainly, you know, I mean, even though it's undefined, we certainly can look at it, in, you know, approaching which infinity it approaches from the left or right. So this is from the left again. So I, I switched. Now, be careful in your calculator. You know, I, I went ahead and to make it a little more clear. I, I switched to degree myself. I used degrees. Make sure you're in degree mode. So I picked it. So if... if uh, Negative pi over 2 is negative 90 degrees. 
I picked an angle just to the left of negative 90. I could have used negative 91, probably would have been okay, but I just made it closer to the negative 90 just to make the value be larger. So negative 90.1 would be to the left of negative 90 degrees, and it would be approaching it from the left. And you see I've got a big negative number here. So therefore, that's definitely clearly negative infinity. Once again, you could have graphed this as 1 over cosine, but when you graph, make sure you're in radian mode. Graphs are much nicer to deal with in radian mode. You might have to play around with your window a little bit to get it work to work. That one should be just fine. Vertical asymptotes. Now the one side of limits has a definition that if you approach uh, the value from negative and positive infinity from right and left the negative of the value of x and you get negative infinity and or positive infinity either one of them as your limit then that's sort of the limit definition of a vertical asymptote now uh, the way I like to look at it, we can do it without limits, and this is sort of the way that I would teach this from a college algebra standpoint, is I would factor that denominator, which I did right here, so pulled out an x, pulled out an x, a 2 minus x, and 2 plus x. Now, that means you have three discontinuities down there, 0, positive 2, and negative 2, but that does not mean that those are all going to be vertical asymptotes. But that's where they're going to come from, is what makes the denominator zero. But the, uh, the rule of thumb is, is if any of these cancel with the numerator, and that includes canceling to leave a negative one, that's sort of an informal way to look at it. That means that will be a discontinuity that's not a vertical asymptote. In fact, it would be a hole in a graph, like down here in this next problem. It would just produce a hole. But then another way, and that means the other two would be would be your two vertical asymptotes. But if the limit exists, it's not going to be a vertical asymptote. So that's how I can double check that. If I evaluate the limit as x goes to 2 of this, what would happen is you would cancel those two and it would leave a negative 1 on top. All right? Make this a little smaller. So if I cancel that, that would leave negative 1 right there. Well, two. Small there, negative 1. And then on the bottom, I would plug in 2, and I'd have 2. I'm sorry, I'm using a mouse here instead of my stylus to write this. A little messy. Over 4. And then, therefore, that would have a limit of 1 over, negative 1 over 8. So if your limit exists at that particular discontinuity, it will not be a vertical asymptote. It will be a hole in the graph. Still a discontinuity but not a vertical asymptote. So therefore, that's why it's only those two, and I guess I didn't bother to circle which answer it is. I have the answer marked, but maybe it'll help. There we go. It's definitely B. All right, not C. You know, that would have been tempting to pick C as the answer. Number 18, I got a little probably messy with my drawing here. But I don't think this one's too, uh, my added blue lines. I don't think this is too difficult, though. You've got discontinuities. Those holes are both discontinuities. And you've got a, a y-axis that's clearly a vertical asymptote. So that's a discontinuity. So you have discontinuities at negative 2, 0, and 2. Similar numbers to the last problem. I wonder if that... It's the same graph. Probably not, but all right, doesn't matter. Come down here. Use the intermediate value theorem that shows to prove there's a solution between two and three. And the intermediate value theorem says that you will have a solution equal to zero, as a zero of the polynomial, if um you ha have a change in signs of your y values at those two points. So in this case, between 2 and 3, when I evaluated uh, 2, I get 
11, 3, I get negative 46. So what that's implying is that to go from 11 to negative 46 for y, you had to cross the x-axis somewhere between 2 and 3. So that's somewhere that you crossed it is, would be where it would be equal to 0 right there. So that's, that's all that's saying. That's really not too much to have to worry about, I don't think. Where's the function continuous? Well, basically it's going to be continuous anywhere that it's not discontinuous. So for this one, cosine of x over x cubed, we're only looking at the denominator here for discontinuities. Keep that in mind. Nothing wrong with a fraction being 0 in the numerator. So 0 is the only discontinuity, so it's continuous everywhere but 0. Just wrote that in interval notation form. And then just x not equal to 0. That's not too bad. Now, we're going to establish if our discontinuities are removable or non-removable. Okay, first thing you want to do is establish what your discontinuities are. Your discontinuities are whatever make the original function zero without canceling any factors. Do not cancel factors out when determining discontinuities. You're only allowed to cancel factors out when you are evaluating a limit. So very important. Keep that in mind. That's, sometimes people get confused by that. So that, the fact that this has x squared minus 16, I don't even care what's on top. That automatically factors into x minus 4 and x plus 4. I have two discontinuities, plus and minus 4. Now, to determine whether or not they're removable or non-removable, Surprise! it's only asking removable here, but I would have asked for both normally. But which, So I identified both in the solutions. Uh, it's a real straightforward rule. If you evaluate your limit at your discontinuity, and that limit does exist, if it exists, it's removable. If that limit does not exist, it is non-removable. It's that straightforward. Meaning removables are generally going to be holes. And non-removables are going to be discontinuities, or if it's a piecewise function, it's graphs that separate, things like that. So let's see what I did here. Now, let me mention, so evaluating the limit, here's, so I did cancel x minus 4s there. To evaluate the limit, that's okay, but not for determining discontinuities. So the x minus 4 is gone, so I just used 1 over x plus 4, put in negative 4, I got 1 over 0, that's a DNE does not exist. Therefore, that makes negative 4 a non-removable discontinuity. The limit as x approaches the other discontinuity of 4. I use the same 1 over x plus 4. I get 1 over 8. That does exist, meaning that 4 is a removable discontinuity. So that is all we have to do for that. If you remember that, that's, that's all you have to know. You don't have to overcomplicate this any. All right. Given this function, find a value of c so that f is continuous for all x. Well, um, individually, these functions, you know, x plus whatever c is, is going to be a line. That's going to be a parabola. So, you know, that's, 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 that's the way this problem would always be. We're not going to, the individual functions aren't going to have discontinuities. All we are is interested in looking in is, is will the piecewise function connect? That's it. If it connects, it will be continuous everywhere. So what we're going to do is find the value of C that makes it correct. So if 0 is the point of separation, so that's why I need to worry about where it's going to correct, connect. So uh, that's why I put 0 in for this X right here. I put 0 in for that x right there, and then I solve for c, which became 2. So if this, if this would have been 5 right there, where I have 0, 5 is what I would have put in for x on top, and 5 is what I would have put in on x on the bottom, and then solve for c to make it fit. So this one, as long as c is x plus 2, that piecewise function, each half. The left half is the line. The right, uh, this right half is the um, parabola. Usually you don't see these written this way, but it, it's okay. It doesn't matter mathematically, but usually they write the less than, the, the smaller, less than or less than or equal to first, and the greater than or equal to 
second. But that's okay. It's still a valid piecewise function. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I would have put that top line on the bottom. But that's all right. No harm. Find the limit as x goes to infinity. Now my notes for these. Sort of like a similar way you find horizontal asymptotes, the way I would teach it in algebra. But you can actually do this, this use the same technique here. If, when it goes to infinity, you only care about the largest powers. Believe it or not, these smaller, even that x cubed will become ins insignificant after a while. I know it seems unlikely, but it's the 6x to the 4th and 3x to the 4th that dominate the show on this problem. Now, always watch to make sure, you know, don't assume your highest power will be will be written first. You know, like you'll see that in the next problem we'll show you. So that's why I just I didn't only be only at infinity. <coughs> you know, no at a regular, regular numerical value, you can't just toss out all that stuff. So all you do is evaluate the limit of this part only. You can cancel the x to the fourth, and you just have six over three, which is two. Or you can just kind of look at it. The rule is if the, if the largest powers are the same, all you have to do is take a ratio of their coefficients. Uh, not, the, not the exponents, but the ratio of the coefficients. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Now here's what I was talking about. I did this on purpose so you can see. Okay, you have your 6x cubed as your dominating largest term on top. But the first term on bottom is not your largest term. Don't forget to include this negative. It wouldn't have mattered. Well, it would have mattered here, actually, but you got to keep that negative. It doesn't matter sometimes. So it's negative 7x squared. So you see I, I reduced it as it goes to negative infinity. So in this case, you have to just kind of reduce, reduce the x's and see what happens because it's not the same power. When it's larger on top, you just re reduce it. So that leaves x to the first. Then you put your, and then keep the sign of infinity is important. So you put negative infinity in there, but you have a negative out there. That coefficient does make a difference. So the negative 6 over 7 times negative infinity does make it positive infinity. So that negative with that 7x squared was very important. Now let me mention the last case, if I don't have an example of it here. So there's three cases where the powers are the same. This one was larger power on top than bottom. And then the last case is when you have a larger power on bottom than top, the uh, answer is automatically zero. And that kind of makes sense because your denominator would grow so much faster. And when the denominator in a fraction gets smaller, you're getting close, larger, excuse me, larger, it's, the fraction's getting smaller, getting closer to zero. Now this one, you don't have to actually use the formal squeeze theorem to come to this conclusion. Uh, but I did. In other words, I knew that cosine of 4x is always between negative 1 and 1, so it would always be between negative 1 over x and 1 over x. And the squeeze theorem says if you know that your outside two limits go to the same value, the one that's the function that squeezed between them has to go to that same value. Because the cosine might seem a little weird, you know, because it's, it, it's not approaching anything. Remember, cosine just takes on values between negative 1 and 1 as you proceed. You know, it just takes on different numbers. But that's, that's the point. It's always staying between negative 1 and 1. While this denominator is getting massively large, or in this case massively small, doesn't really matter, a constant over either infinity, you know, 1 over negative infinity is certainly 0. So you just have a, a, a rotating constant revolving between negative 1 and 1 over infinity, so that leads 0. But the squeeze theorem just kind of formally guarantees it's zero, but you don't really need it to conclude that it's zero. Now be careful here, this one's a little bit tricky. Now this this is, uh, now because I'm working with limits and I'm working with infinities here, I, I want you to notice that this, this is not proper algebra and it doesn't have to be. You can never, algebraically, you can never break a radical up, but I can limit infinity wise. So the last thing I want anybody to do is to get in some poor algebra habits. But because as you go to infinity, I think you can kind of see that minus 216 is really not going to have any value, right? So so I have the square root of 36 t squared over the t on bottom. Now 
technically the square root of t squared is the square root of t. I mean square root, sorry, absolute value of t. Now that doesn't matter here because it's approaching positive infinity, but if you look in my notes, there is an example that would make a difference if this was going to negative infinity. Because what would have happened is you would have gotten negative 6 as the answer instead of positive 6. Because you still would have had positive on top, but it would have been negative on bottom, so it would have made it negative. That's in my notes. but So I just wrote that there. But uh, So just be careful. Watch for that. But then don't forget, you know, take the square root of 36 also and get 6. Don't make this mistake and think it's 36. All right, so it, sometimes that problem fools people, but... Go back and look at my notes. I'm not sure if that was on any of the quizzes or but it's absolutely in my notes. Okay, horizontal asymptotes. Uh, this is basically the limit as x goes to infinity. If you have a value, that's the horizontal asymptote. So like for example, Larger power on bottom than top means it goes to zero. Therefore, the horizontal asymptote is zero. When you have a larger power on top than bottom, that's where you get no horizontal asymptotes. I'm going to scroll back up here to this other problem for a second. Right here. So for this problem, let's say they would have asked for horizontal asymptote with this. It would have been y equals 2. See, remember, asymptotes have to always have a variable because they're equations of lines. Limits can just be number answers. So like the limit and the horizontal asymptote are not really the same thing. The limit of the function equals 2, but the horizontal asymptote is y equals 2 because it's an equation of a line. Same thing with vertical asymptotes. They have to say x equals, not just the number. So like this one, this would absolutely be two different answers if it just had the number 0 sitting there and y equals 0 sitting there. That's not the same thing has to include the y equal. All right, limit definition of the derivative. So you may have to take a look at this one time on an exam. That may pop up once. But, you know, most of the time, you know, use the shortcut rules for the most part. But only use this when you're instructed to because, I mean, it's interesting how this was developed. If you look at my lecture notes to see, you know, that's the fascinating part about math sometimes, about how things were created. But obviously, you know, you want to do things the more efficient way whenever possible. I don't make uh, people memorize this definition, but the definition is of the derivative is f prime of x is the limit of h goes to 0 of f of x plus h right there, minus f of x all over h as h goes to 0. So the right-hand part of the numerator is always your original function. So here, I, I have notes similar to this in my notes, but if you put x plus h in there, for, yeah, you should see this in my notes easily, x plus h squared, boil that out. Make sure you know how to square a binomial on this class. It's very important that, uh, that you know thing, that you don't do something like this. Once again, this is going to look sloppy because I'm using a mouse, but, you know, it's good to get out of bad math habits. In other words, a plus b squared is not equal to a <laughs> pretty terrible a there plus b squared that's not true it's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared so that's what's happening here you have x squared plus 2xh plus h squared and then you put x in there so that's where, I don't want to look at this ugly thing anymore. Bye-bye. So then there's your x plus h squared. Your x is, you replace x with x plus h, and then your 1 is just 1. So here's all this stuff. So the idea when you do this definition, what's supposed to happen is, every term in the numerator that does not contain an x will cancel. I mean, can, yes. I mean, that contains an H will cancel, excuse me. Every term without an H need, needs to cancel. X only is in numbers. I don't want to say just X, because it's X's and numbers. And that's what happens here, X squared. So all that stuff on the right where F of X is, that's got to go every time. So then you're just inter interested in what's left. 
So you can have an X and an H. See that as long as it has an H, has an H, has an H, that's good. That's perfect. Because the idea is we want to be able to factor out an H on top because we're trying to get rid of that H on bottom. That's our issue. Because you see, that's what puts your I guess that's what gives your zero on bottom, right? It's putting the H in there. Zero for H. So the H is cancel. And there we go. You reinsert the zero for H here, not X. Be careful. It's kind of a little bit different with two variables here. I don't know, usually our limits are just normally sticking number in for X. But no, the X stays X, and you put zero in for H, so you would end up with 2X plus 1, which, yes, you know, that's the correct derivative using the product rule. I mean, the, the basic power rule and that kind of stuff. All right, let's see what we have down here. So here's the power rule. I saw that thinking that power rule. And that's one's pretty straightforward. X to the 4 is 4X cubed. 6 times 5 is 30. X to the 5th, negative 5 times negative 4 over 5 would be negative 4. Subtract 1 from the exponent is negative 6. And the derivative of 7 is 0. Um, on exams, where I, uh, when I have students write stuff out, I'm a big fan where I don't, you know, I, negative exponents do not hurt my feelings one bit. Um, but if, you're, if the exam is in a multiple choice format, it's very likely they might drop this back down to the bottom and make it divided by x to the 6. Which, if you're looking at the answer choices, that would not be hard to see. But I would never count off on a handwritten test if you didn't change that. Some instructors might, but negative exponents don't hurt my feelings any. Here's another limit definition. This one's a little uglier. But you see, so I put uh, the first part is I put x plus h in there for x. So it's 3 times x plus h. That's why I put parentheses in there because the 3 will be multiplied by both of those. Then I subtract f of x and then h on bottom. So here's that conjugate deal I told you about earlier. So we've got to conjugate wherever the radical is. So the opposite, you know, minus becomes plus. So plus plus. Now, the part that you're trying to conjugate, you multiply out, but down here, notice that you leave the, you leave the other terms just written as multiplication, but don't actually distribute it. It would defeat the purpose. So that H stays there, and these other two just stay there in parentheses. Because remember, we're just trying to get rid of that H. We don't care about the rest of this stuff. You know, whatever happens with that happens. So, uh, so let's leave the H right where it is. Let's see what happens up here. The radicals cancel. Basically, it's a difference of two squares. You know, a minus b times a plus b is a squared minus b squared. So the, rad the radical square roots cancel. Leaves 3x plus 3h plus 1. The radicals cancel here. Minus 3x plus 1. The 3x's cancel. The 1's cancel. It leaves 3h. That's good because all the x's and, and non-h terms went away like we're supposed to only have h terms, and we do. Therefore, the h's cancel. And you reinsert 0 for h, not x, for h. So you have the square root of 3x plus 1 plus the square root of 3x plus 1. Well, anytime you have the same thing, you know, same thing added together, it makes 2 of that thing. So, like, you know, x plus x is 2x, so that's where the 2 comes from. 1 of something plus 1 of something is 2 of something. So there you go. That one looked a little more gruesome, but if you just follow that conjugate process, it looks worse than it really is. There weren't a lot of steps to it. Problem 31. Now this problem is basically designed for before you learn the quotient rule. So it's a, I would not use a quotient rule for this. I would still do this problem the way it's done here. So before you learn the quotient rule, this is the way you would do this, is every term is divided out, and then you take the derivative. So 5x cubed divided by x squared is 5x. Negative 4x squared over x squared is negative 4. 3x over x squared is 3x to the negative 1. Minus 2 
over x squared is the same as negative 2 x to the negative 2. And take the derivative term by term. 5x would be 5. Derivative negative 4 would be 0. And then negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. So then negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So there's your derivative. Or I wrote it this way, as I explained before, if it was multiple choice and you needed to see the answers that had positive exponents. But I put my flag means, you know, that anytime I put a flag next to something, that means I like that answer as is. So that's... All right, this one is testing us to see if we can handle radicals. So the square root of x is x to the 1 half. So obviously you have to be able to convert radicals to exponent form to take derivatives. Now this one's x to the 1 half, but it's on bottom. So when you bring it up, that makes it x to the negative 1 half. So now we need to use our power rule. So 6 derivative of 3x squared would be 6x. 2 times 3x. Uh, 1 half comes down, makes that negative 1 half. x to the negative... 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. 1 half times 7 is negative 1 half. And then negative 1 half for the exponent minus 1 is negative 3 halves. Once again, you uh, convert that to positive if you need to. Uh, one thing I want to mention, if this was a handwritten exam versus uh, multiple choice, is on a handwritten exam, I'm, I'm very picky. Some things I'm not picky about, you can see with negative exponents, I don't care. But derivative notation, same thing with limit notation. You know, you, when you take a derivative, it need, it's a, the derivative is a function. It, it, you can't just say the derivative equals the stuff after the equal sign and write that as an answer. To get full credit, now the problem is not wrong, but I do penalize a couple points, but you got to have derivative notation there. F prime of x equals. It's, it, it, it just needs to be there. It's meaningless without it. This is a, a, it's a function, not an expression. Like you said, add 2x plus 2 plus 3x minus 5, you get 5x minus 3. That's, that's just an expression, not a function. So I want to mention that for a handwritten test. Equation of a tangent line. Okay, let's see. I prefer y equals mx plus b. That's the way the final answer is usually written. If, you're, if you'd rather work it out in point-slope form, knock yourself out. This is pretty easy if you do it this way. Now, one thing we know about the derivative, one of, the, one of its features is it gives you the slope of the tangent line of a curve at a given point. So if we want the equation of the tangent line, we're going to need the tangent slope. Tangent slope, therefore, will be the derivative. So the derivative of this is pretty easy. x minus x squared would be y prime equals 1 minus 2x. Plug in the x value of 3, you get negative 5. That's your m. That's your slope. It's negative 5. Now, one thing I want to mention is that you don't have to be given, you only have to be given the x here. You don't have to be given the y because if you weren't given the y, you need to get the y if you're not given the y, but uh, it's easy to get the y. Just take it from the original function. So as long as you have your x, you plug 3 in there, 3 minus 3 squared, 3 minus sine is negative 6. So obviously, then just keep that in mind. If you say, wait, you didn't give me the y value. It's only the x. What do I do? Find the y. Okay, so here's how I like to do this. Like I said, this is not the only way to do it. You might encounter other videos that do this a little bit differently. and I'm all for whatever correct method you like. I say keyword being correct. So I start with y equals mx plus b. I just found my slope of negative 5, so I know it's y equals negative 5x plus b. So the big mystery here is solving for b. And I know that x is 3. I know that y is negative 6. So I plug those in there, just do some real basic algebra, and I would get a value of b equals 9. So therefore, I know that the equation of the tangent line is y equals negative 5x plus 9. And there we go. Find the values of x for 
if any, where the X is a, produces horizontal tangent lines. Okay, horizontal tangent lines, uh, horizontal automatically implies slope zero. So you're looking for the values of X that make the derivative equal to zero. So we're not plugging zero in for X. Of course, zero could be an answer for X, but you're setting the derivative, which of this one's pretty easy enough, right? Y prime equals 3X squared minus 12. You're setting that derivative equal to zero. So that ends up being X squared equals 4, which gives you two solutions. Very important. That comes up a lot of times, you know, in calculus and math in general. You know, when you have X squared equals something, remember it always has a plus and minus solution. Now, there may be, there'll be some situations later where we might not want both of those values for whatever reason. For example, if it was an application problem and, we're, and, and it was a unit of length, we wouldn't need the negative. But, but always mathematically it produces two values when x squared is set equal to a positive. So make sure you don't forget to do it and find that people will forget to do that every once in a while. It's not that they don't know it. It's probably just more a matter of just paying attention than anything else. So I just wanted the uh, uh, x values. If they wanted the points, like the next one says, points, you would plug in negative 2 in there for x to get your y. Then you would plug positive 2 in there to get you your y. And then, then that would tell you the actual point on the graph versus just the x value of the point. That's the only difference. So what do we have right here? Uh, find the points the graph is tangent is parallel to the line y equals 9x plus 9. Okay, parallel to that line means it will have the same slope as that line. So basically it's telling us, you know, instead of setting your derivative equal to zero, sometimes these problems will just say, you know, with tangent parallel to slope of four, they'll just tell you the slope. And you set the derivative equal to that number. Well, here you just have to do a little basic extraction and figure out that slope is nine. Just a coincidence that that's a nine for the y-intercept. But the slope is 9. So that means we, we need the value that wants points this time. So we'll get the x, then we'll plug it in x, or however many. There could be more than one. So we take the derivative, set it equal to that 9 right there. So the derivative would be uh, 4x squared minus 3. f prime of x is 4x minus 3. Set that equal to that 9. And we get 3, pretty easy algebra. And then to get the y value, plug 3 back in your original function. Always your original function. Sometimes people will plug things right back in the derivative when they shouldn't. You know, your points on the graph, and that'll be important in Chapter 3. Points on the graph always come from the original function. So we only have one here, the point 3, 9. Okay, this one's very similar. I just went ahead and graphed it to show this one to show that my answer was accurate. You could do the same thing if you wanted to, I guess, to see if your answer looks okay. So, this time it actually, instead of the slope, it's, it's giving the slope, therefore, but it wants the equations of those two lines. There's two, so we have to set the derivative. That means there's going to be two values. So we take this derivative, 1 over x, which is x to the negative 1. The derivative will be negative x to the negative 2. Now, once again, I, you know, I don't mind the neg negative exponent. But when, when I know I'm about to algebraically be solving for something, I want it to be a positive exponent. So I would have dropped that down. So we're setting that equal to negative 9 to find the, the x values where the point's going to be. So we have negative 1 over uh, x squared equals negative 9. And the negatives cancel. Cross multiply. You got 9x squared equals 1. You have x squared equals 1 over 9. Well, just like I said a few minutes ago, it's going to be plus and minus. So you have plus and minus 1 third. So you see I come over here. I know my, if their slope's negative 9, I know both of them are going to be y equals 9x plus b. But they are going to have different intercepts. So this one we're setting it equal to and the, here are the two y values. I, see, this one I had to calculate, like I was telling you earlier. We had to calc, you may have to calculate them. So you put in negative one third in the original function, 
1 over that's negative 3. They're basically reciprocals. So 1 third is going to be 3. So here's the negative 3 I did first. Here's negative 9. Here's the negative 1 third. Solve for B, you get negative 6. Over here, I put in 1 third for X, set that equal to 3 that we got from these two right here. And you get B equals positive 6. So you have two lines, Y equals negative 9X plus 6. And Y equals 9X minus 6. So this one's obviously right there is the, is the minus 6 because the Y intercept sitting at negative 6. I didn't need to Y, I didn't widen the scale. But then the negative, so the other one's hitting a positive 6 up here. So there we go. Finding tangent, parallel tangent lines. Uh, given the graph of f, find the values at which x is not defined. f prime, excuse me, at x is not defined. Okay, first of all, the derivative is never defined at a discontinuity. However, there could be more answers than just discontinuities. This one's pretty easy, but I've given some on test with a graph that has just a little more stuff going on. And I found that more people, and I, I would ask, you know, where are the discontinuities and where is the derivative undefined? And I would often find that people would leave a few of the answers off for the derivative. You're looking for, okay, discontinuities, of course. But you can have, the, the, the function can be continuous and still be not defined in the derivative. And th those cases are, if you go back and look at my notes, we have endpoints, sharp points, you know, where a graph might do this, point like that, and then vertical tangents. I tend to not put graphically, I put vertical tangents on a, an exam because that uh, could be a little tricky to see, but endpoints are easy to see. Like there's an endpoint there at zero, and, and sharp points are easy to see. But let's say um, I would have put a dot right there instead of an arrow. So arrow keeps going and going. If we'd have put a dot right there, and I stopped that function right there, didn't go any further. The function would not be discontinuous there. It would be continuous all the way, all the way to the endpoint. But the derivative would be undefined at the endpoint. So what is that? Let me count that out there. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you wouldn't have a discontinuity at 8, but you would have the derivative being not defined at 8. So like I said, there can be you know, more answers sometimes for this than there is discontinuities. Actually, this would be the same answer for discontinuities. But there's more stuff going on with those endpoints and sharp points, and vertical tangents. All right. Okay. Position function. Average velocity. Do not confuse average velocity with instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity is a derivative. Average velocity is just basically an algebraic slope. And that's what this one is. Basically, you know, if I ask this question, I'd usually get the formula for it. But it's, it's you know, basically, it's the same slope calculation. Y1, Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. In this case, it would be S of 2 minus S of 0 over 2 minus 0. So we put 2 in there. And I didn't show the work here, but... 6 times 2, two squared, 24, plus 8 is 32, plus 4 is 36. Put 0 in there, that's easy to see, that's 4. And the bottom, of course, 2 minus 0 is 0. And 36 minus 4 divided by 2 ends up being 16. That's your average velocity. And, and one way you can tell the difference, you know, if it's an average velocity, it's got to give two, a range of values for, you know, 2x. Two, two two x's, or in this case, two t's, or whatever. But instantaneous velocity is always at one number. So they could say, what's the instantaneous velocity at uh, 1.5 seconds? You would take the derivative of that function and then plug in 1.5, and that would tell you the instant. 
All right. All right, so here's a function for a ball thrown upward. Okay, maximum height attained by the ball. That's going to be where the derivative is equal to zero. That's where you're going to hit your horizontal tangent, meaning the ball will be coming right back down after that. So for max, uh, so to find that, that finds the value, the time to reach the maximum height is setting the derivative equal to zero. To find the maximum height, you would take that time and then plug it back in the original function. So you see, I took the derivative, negative 32t plus 80, set equal to zero. So at 2.5 seconds, that's where it reached its maximum height. So then I plug 2.5 into my original function. Obviously, calculate use calculator for that, and I got 196 feet. So that so the derivative tells you the time, and then plugging the, that value you solved in the original function will tell you the height. Part B: What is the speed when it hits the ground? Okay, that's instantaneous. Well, impact speed would be instantaneous velocity. But first thing we have to know is uh, when, uh, how long does it take to hit the ground? Now this one factors nice and neat. You know, worst case scenario, you could uh, use quadratic formula, or you could even graph the original function and sort of trace it and find the x-intercept value and do it that way too. I'm not that worried about how you get it as much as how you use it in this part in pink right here. But this one actually, uh, after I reduced it, sets up real nice to factor. Obviously, we don't want negative one seconds, so taking six seconds to hit the ground. So the impact velocity would be the derivative from we got up here evaluated at six seconds. So it's hitting the ground at a speed. The negative just means it's going downward. So it's heading downward at a rate of 112 feet per second at impact. All right. Here's another. Once the average velocity from 2 to 2 plus h, you got to do a little bit of algebra here. So it'd be s of 2 plus h minus s of 2. So you see, I put in, took the 2 plus h, plugged it into the original function. Sort of, this is sort of like the definition of the derivative. Um, So you see, you square that out. Remember, we don't square the first and last terms. You foil it out. You get 4 plus 4h plus h squared. Put in the 2 plus h for the next t. You get 32 plus 16h. Don't forget, the negative here goes all the way through the parentheses, makes every term negative. So it's a little messy here that you can combine your like terms and tidy it up a little bit. So you'd have a 288 when you combine the numbers, a negative 48h for the h's, negative 16h squared. And, which is up here, S of 2. So when you plug 2 in there, you're just going to get 288. So the 288s, you know, anything that doesn't have an H is going to cancel pretty much. So, um, so you're left with negative 48H minus 16H squared over H. And then that, you factor out an H and cancel. You get negative 48 minus 16H. But look at this result right here. And you'll see how that affects this next answer. Suppose this would have asked, you know, then what's the limit as h goes to 0, which is kind of the definition of the derivative at 2, because we're doing 2 plus h, not x plus h. So you put in 0 here, you get negative 48, don't you, which matches this answer right here. You see it's asking for the instantaneous velocity at, at time 2. So you take the derivative, plug in the 2, you get negative 48, which, like I said, would have been this same answer had we said the limit as h approaches 0. Because all this mess would have been doing the same thing as this had we taken it one step further. But obviously to get this answer without doing the limit, you have to work it out because you don't necessarily know what, you know, is it going to be 16h? Would it be 24h? Would it be 12h? Yeah, the h goes away when you do the limit, but at this step, the h is still there. So you don't know what it's going to, that's why we had to work it out. All right, uh, now we're getting into 
product and quotient rules looks like. So here's a quotient rule. Uh, sometimes people get the, the, the numerator reversed on the quotient rule. You do need to know the product and quotient rule. Bottom, that's why I like to say it. Bottom times the derivative of the top, which is 1, minus top times the derivative of the bottom, which is 2t plus 10. Somebody told me one time they heard it said as, uh, don't let this confuse you by any means, but with the top part being called high and the bottom being called low, low d high minus high d low. I just kind of laughed and I just kind of laughed. It confused me. So, I mean, I knew what they were doing. Low d high meant low times the derivative of the top minus top high d low, which is top times the derivative of the bottom. I guess because I already know how to do it, I didn't really need it, but hey, if that helps, that helps you, more power to you. Low D high minus high D low. I just say bottom times the derivative of the top minus top times the derivative of the bottom. So now we have top T minus H, bottom 2T plus 10. Do a little algebra here. You never need to expand out that denominator. One thing to keep in mind, and this, this is a very common mistake that students make, these terms do, that I'm pointing at right now, do not cancel. Do not, I cannot stress that much enough because that, because that minus sign right there. For example, if you had, I'm going to try my terrible attempt at writing here. A minus B over A squared. I mean, you could split them into two fractions, but I'm talking about without splitting them into two fractions, you cannot cancel those A's because of that minus sign right there. Same reason here. Same reason. And so we're not, see, notice we're not splitting this into two fractions, so therefore nothing can reduce. All right, always important algebra. That's very common for students to do, to cancel. Okay, a little algebra tidy up. Okay, so you foil these two together. And you got to be careful with this negative in front, so you'll end up with a negative 2t squared. Um, oh, because this 2t plus 10 is actually a multiple of that. It, that's why there's only two terms here instead of three. You see you have a minus 10t, and that cancels with that 10t. So they cancel. That's why there's only two terms here. And then if we have to simplify the numerator, not too difficult. 1t squared squared minus 2t squared is negative 1t squared plus 10t. 25 plus 50 is 75. And there's your simplified derivative. I had it flagged up here, just meaning that that was the derivative in general. So I'll go ahead and put another flag down here. That's the simplified result. Very good. Let's come down here to number 42. Now we got some trig derivatives, so you need to make sure you know all six of those. Yeah, so I would not do that. You know, for simple things, you don't really want to use the quotient rule. It's a waste of your time. So 10 over x, just bring the x up. Make it x to the negative 1. Um, so... That would be negative 1 times 10 would be negative 10. Negative 1 minus 1 is x to the negative 2. And the derivative of positive secant is positive secant tan. So, that's all, so that was just a matter of knowing that. There was no real work to do. So we're looking at answer D. We've got negative 10 over x squared plus 5 sec x tan x. And that would be it. One thing I want to mention, I, I, sometimes I'll see people have trouble even, they make certain things, like say, not trying to work, like you have y equals x over 10, and they'll make a derivative of this be a lot harder, you know, I'll see people try to do quotient rules, or some reason, that some people struggle with that for some reason, but just think of it this way, that's just a coefficient of x, that's just saying 1 over 10. Times x. So, wouldn't the derivative of any coefficient of x, you know, the derivative of 6x is 6, right? So the derivative of 
one tenth x is just one tenth. But you'd be amazed how many people I've had struggle with that. I don't know what bugs them if they think they're supposed to be doing a quotient rule or anything like that. But no, it's just x over 10 is the same thing as 1 over 10 times x. So let's, you know, sometimes calculus can be complicated, but let's don't take simple things and make them more complicated. That's no good. Okay, another one we have to know the derivative form here. So derivative t to the fourth, of course, is 4t cubed. So the only derivative 5 is 0, but the only trick here is the cosecant. The derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. So since there is a minus, so I've it written right over there, since there's a minus there times that minus, that's what changes it into a plus. So it would always be the opposite sign there. So, All right, so that could have been tricky if we didn't know that there was a minus, or we might have incorrectly chosen answer B. X times sine of X, product rule. Product rule, you kind of have a little flexibility. The quotient rule, you got to be careful because there's a minus in that numerator. So that's why you got to go with the right order. Bottom derivative of the top, minus top derivative of the bottom. But product rule doesn't matter because plus, you know, for example, if you have A plus B, that's the same thing as B plus A. Now, the only difference it might make if it was something that was in a multiple choice format, albeit an exam or a quiz or something, if it was a multiple choice question, you know, your answers might be in the reverse order of the way you did the product rule. But that certainly would not cause you as a reason to miss the problem, but just watch for that. So I usually go f prime g first. That's just normally what I do. So the derivative of x is 1. I didn't write the 1 in there, but so it's 1 times sine of x, which is sine of x, plus x times the derivative of sine is cosine. And that was it for that one. I have to clarify what the answer was there. So sine of x plus x cos of x. All right, this is a little messy. You got two product rules, but it's not that difficult. It's a little messy. So the derivative t to the seventh is seven t six, and then times cos x. So f prime g plus f, which is t7, times the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. You know, in a handwritten test, you got to be careful, because that's another thing I'd count off for, too, is you couldn't, you have to have, if you're going to write it like this, you have to have parentheses until you move the, you know, unless you move the negative out in front. You can leave it like that, but you can't not have the parentheses there, because that would look like subtraction. It would look like just t to the seventh minus sine of t. So that's no good. So either parentheses is fine or negative in front is fine. Now come over here because this has a minus sign, even though the product rule has a plus, that minus will affect everything in the parentheses. So the derivative, uh, I keep, I'm keeping the 9t together as one term as my f. So the derivative of 9t would be 9 times, so that's f prime times g, which is sine, plus f, which is 9t, times the derivative of cosine, sine, which is cosine. And then the derivative of cosine is negative sine. We have a negative in front. So that's what changes to positive. So like I just explained about the negative in the parentheses, that would make both of those things here negative inside that parentheses because the negative in front. We happen to get a couple of terms that cancel. So then you will end up with answer choice B. Like I say, it's different order, but so it has the negative T7. They probably did a different order of the product rule, like I was saying. So they have that term first, 7T6 cos T second, negative 9T cos T third. All right. So just... Be careful, rearrange answers, you'll be all right.
find the second derivative. This one's pretty easy. I usually don't like to have problems too complicated if you have to take multiple derivatives. All right, so the derivative y prime would be, you know, notice I have my notation there, y prime, y double prime, 3 times 7, 21x squared. Derivative of 6x squared would be 12x minus, then you take one more derivative of that. So the derivative of 21x squared is 42x, and the derivative of negative 12x would be negative 12. So your second derivative would be 42x minus 12. All right, now let's see what we have down here. Acceleration. Okay, once again, velocity, instantaneous velocity, or, or if you, you know, the way you would know the difference, if it says velocity at t equals 3 or something like that, you know, when it's at a single point, that implies instantaneous, like I was telling you earlier. It's when you have two points that it could be average, you know, likely it's average velocity, but it could, you know, you could also have to do instantaneous velocity at each endpoint. All right, so acceleration is second derivative. So you just take the, so I just labeled the velocity was first derivative. So 24t squared, 18t plus 8. Take one more derivative of that. So 24t squared would be 48t. 18t squared would be 18. So your acceleration function is 48t plus 18. And there's our value 3. Plug in there. And we get an acceleration of 162 feet per second squared. So as long as you know acceleration is the second derivative, that should be no problem. Here's one that's third derivative. So once again, I don't like these to get too out of hand. For the complication if you're taking multiple derivatives. Yeah. Trying to clean that up a little bit, but I'm not going to worry about it. 9x squared would be the first derivative. First term. Derivative of 6x squared would be 12x, and then minus 4x would be minus 4. Next derivative, 18x plus 12. And then the last third derivative would be 18. So that's not too bad. Okay, this one's fourth derivative. And notice I use this notation down here too. Remember, you look at my notes, say they uh, you quit using the prime after the third derivative. Either that, like that D notation right there, D4, that, that applies to multiple derivatives. Or they put, you don't want to just put an exponent there, obviously, because that would be y to the fourth power. So parentheses around a number in the exponent, that's your derivative. But you won't see that that much because finding derivatives that deep is usually not required. Okay, so you got to be careful. Uh, derivative, first sine x will be cos x positive. But as soon as you take the derivative to go to the second derivative, derivative of cos would be negative sine. So it becomes negative sine x. Now, the derivative of positive sine is positive cosine, but we already had a negative in front here. So that negative just stays with it. But then the derivative cos of x will be sine of x, negative sine of x, excuse me. So that negative will take care of this negative here and turn it back to positive. So the fourth derivative would be uh, back to where you started, plus 9 sine of x. So if you ever want to impress someone, you can then do something like this and tell them you can figure out the 400th derivative in, in two seconds. <laughs> I actually wouldn't take two seconds because every fourth derivative, you're back to where you started. So as long as the derivative was a multiple of four, so the 400th derivative would be the same thing also. But I don't think you'd impress too many people with that, but who knows. Equation of a tangent line, okay, we've done that before. It's just this one is a little more complicated derivative. 
Now we're bringing chain rule into play here. So now chain rule is coming up. Very important that chain rule is all throughout calculus. Easy to make mistakes on derivatives involving chain rules. Now you could do a quotient rule here, but you know anytime that I just have a number on top, I just bring up the stuff from the bottom. It's just so much more efficient. So just bring this bottom up and make it a negative one and then just do the basic chain rule, which is also known in this case as the general power rule. And which means so you bring the negative one down. Remember this, bring the negative one, that'll make that negative twenty seven. You change this to negative two, you subtract one. But here's the key that makes this chain rule is you're taking the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. That's the key. So you got to remember to take the derivative inside of that parentheses. All right, so I simplified this a little bit. I really didn't have to because I want because my x is one. All I want is the slope. So I could have put one when I first took the derivative right there, either place. Put one in either one of those. Plug one in there. Here you see it easier though. So be negative 54 over one squared plus two squared. So one negative 54 over over nine would be negative six. So I have uh, so you know you have y equals negative six plus x plus b. So we have x which is one. We have b which is uh, y which is nine, and we solve for b. Remember I told you earlier that if we did not have the y value that we get it by plugging the x into the original function, but we have it. So put in 1 for x, 9 for y, solve for b, you'll get 15. So then your equation of your tangent line will be y equals negative 6x plus 15. Alrighty, so water leaks from a tank, volume, got time t. The volume is 80 minus t squared, so I chose b for volume, but I guess it, it, it's not the end of the world if you just called it y, but it does need to have some letter representing its function name there, so y would be okay. Um, now you could have done this by FOIL. This is only squared power. You could have FOIL it out if you wanted to. But might as well use a chain rule. Bring the 2 down. Reduce that exponent to 1, but derivative of the inside, 80 minus t, which is that negative 1 right there, very important. So I plug the 40 in there into this, and I'll get negative 80 liters per minute. I'm usually not picky on units on a calculus exam, unlike they would be in any kind of engineering, physics, or chemistry exam, like they should be, or I think the units are certainly much more important than those kind of subjects. But here, I'm not as worried about if you get the limits right or not. Save that for those classes. But it would be a uh, liter. Well, I'm not. Oh, there's the liters. I was wondering how did I come up with liters. I didn't know. There, okay, right there. Thing made that. I knew time was in minutes, but 80 negative 80 liters per minute. So. The water is deep. It makes sense that it's negative because the water's volume is decreasing. So it's you know saying it's changing at negative 80 is saying it's decreasing at 80 because the decrease would sort of imply a negative automatically. But just to flat out, what's the rate of change? It's negative 80. All right, here's a good old chain rule. Bring the 3 down, leave the inside intact. Sometimes when I see people do this, they have, obviously they probably had not practiced enough or studied enough, but they'll take the derivative you know, right here and leave the exponent there. Now you've got to be patient. Bring the power down, subtract 1 from the exponent, then tack on the derivative of the inside at the very end. So the derivative of the inside would be 2x plus 5. Um, don't distribute a constant times a power uh, through parentheses where the exponent's anything other than one. You can't do that algebraically. That's wrong. That's another mistake I'll see people make. You know, it's the three can multiply by two x plus five because that's to the first power. That's still you know basic distributive property. But I will see people distribute through parentheses 
where the exponent is not 1, and that is absolutely mathematically incorrect. So let's don't do it. So no need to get cute here. That's all we did is distribute the 3 times 2x plus 5 to get 6x plus 15. Well, here's one like similar to one we did just short briefly ago is let's uh, let's not use the quotient rule here. Let's just bring this up. I mean mathematically you could, but why if you don't have to? Um, bring that up, make that negative 11. So then we, what, what do we do? We use the general power rule, bring the negative 11 down in front, reduce negative 11 by 1 is negative 2, take the derivative of the inside, which would be negative 7, 6 times 3 is 18, subtract 1, is, so it's 18z5, negative 7 plus 18z5. And so once again, you can't send the constant through this parentheses with that power there, but you can send it through the part where you took the derivative of the inside. So that's always the rule of thumb, because that's always going to have an exponent of 1 when the derivative of the inside has no power. Okay, so distribute the negative 11, you'll get 77 minus 198z to the fifth. And then like I said, I don't mind negative exponents, but in a multiple choice format, you might have to look for answers where it's positive. So I went ahead and just dropped it back down anyway. I mean, both of those are mathematically correct. This one's a little different than the other. All right, here's a bunch of little chain rules. First one, y equals x squared plus 1 to the fifth. Bring down the 5 right here. x squared plus 1, subtract 1 is 4. Derivative of the inside is 2x. So I took the 5 times 2x to give me 10x, and then x squared plus 1 to the fourth. Next one, I did quotient rule. So it's bottom times the derivative of the top minus top times the derivative of the bottom, which would be 5. Oh, same thing as right there, isn't it? 5 comes down, leaves a 4, and then the derivative of the inside is 2x. Now, I skipped a step here, but I'm going to explain what I skipped. No point in me trying to write it using this mouse instead of a writing tool, so I'm not on a tablet PC right now. Is, you know, earlier I told you about being careful not to cancel stuff there, but now notice that when these chain rule problems and quotient rule, you see that it has a common factor everywhere, doesn't it? So basically what happened here that you didn't see is uh, out of the three, the smallest was x squared plus 1 to the fourth. So just imagine that x squared plus 1 to the fourth was factored out of the top and the bottom. So if it was factored out of the top, you would have just been left with a 1 here. Then you would have been left with a 1 here. And then the x squared plus 1 that was factored out of the top to the fourth, excuse me, could have reduced with the 1 on bottom, and it would have just left with 6, because that would have been x squared plus 1 to the 4th times x squared plus 1 to the 6th. Then they would have canceled and would have left 6. So now, yes, I didn't show that step, but that's what happened. So this one had a common factor, and we're able to do it. So then that just reduced to... Um, so, so what happened here is you're left with x squared plus 1 minus 10x squared. So the 1 stays there. The 1 is that 1 right there. But then you have x squared minus 10x squared, which would give you not minus 9x squared. And then the bottom stays the same. So the minus 9x squared, once again, is 1x squared minus 10x squared. Number 3, pretty straightforward, I believe now. 19 comes down. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Derivative of the inside would be 5x to the 4th, derivative of x is 1. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Next one's a little messy because you've got product rule and two chain rules there, but 
not that bad. So I'll go f prime g plus f g prime like I normally do. So here I'd bring the 5 down, like I did right there. Change that 5 to a 4. Take the derivative of that inside right there, which is 4x cubed. And then rewrite g. So that was, all that was f prime. Here's g. And then here's f right here rewritten. Now I'm taking the derivative of g from a g prime. So 4 comes down right there. Change that to a 3. Derivative of this inside for g would be 5x to the 4th. And I mentioned you would not need to simplify a derivative this complicated. So uh, unlikely to probably have one that's involved anyway. But well, it looks like I kind of just took a com couple of common factors over there. As long as you're okay with the basic setup and how to use that product rule, mainly that line right there, I think you're okay for the most part. I wouldn't worry about that much for the simplification of one that's involved. I was just more interested in seeing the ability of just taking the product rule and using the, the chain rule appropriately. Okay, once again, brought this one up because there was a constant on top. So that would be to the one-third power on bottom. As soon as you bring it up, it's negative one-third. So negative one-third comes down. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Negative 1 third minus 1 is negative 4 thirds times derivative of the inside, which is 3. So once again, I just dropped it down for the potential to match the answers. The 3 is canceled, but you're still left with a negative there. So it'll be a negative 1 on top, and then that part drops down to the bottom, becomes positive 4 thirds. Now here's another one that's kind of involved also too. Maybe less likely this would be on an exam. At least certainly not simplifying. I would just leave the answer choices unsimplified. But just once again, it doesn't hurt for me to talk through the product rule. I mean the quotient rule. So bottom times the derivative of the top. One third comes down. Subtract one from that exponent's negative two thirds. Derivative of the inside is 3, so that takes care of gf prime, bottom times the derivative of the top, minus top, which is that function, times the derivative of the bottom, 1 half comes down, subtract 1 from the exponent is negative 1 half, derivative of the inside is 4, and then the bottom over g squared, so it's the bottom function squared. Okie doke. All right, trig functions. It gets a little trickier. You're going to be, a lot of people have trouble with chain rules of, of trig functions. Like, for example, if I was to ask what's the derivative of sine of 10x, for example, many people would say it's y prime equals cosine of 10x. That's not quite right. It would be 10 cosine of 10x because you'd have to take the derivative of the 10x. Very common mistake. Hopefully one you won't make. Product rule with a couple of chain rules. A little involved. But these more complicated ones, if you can understand those, that'll make the ones that are less complicated less difficult. Okay, bring the 2 down. So 2 comes down times cosine to the first. Now technically, when we say derivative of the inside, you're taking the derivative of, of cosine. So this negative sign represents a derivative of cosine. And like I said, you can see this in my notes, but let me just kind of draw something real quick here. Think of this as being the, like if, if u is cosine and you're taking the derivative of u squared. Well, chain rule says you would have y prime equals 2u times du dx or u prime. So it would be 2u, which I have right here, 2 cos x, and then that u prime right there is the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine. Okay, so this is the product rule, so that's f prime g, g is sine cubed, 
plus f, which is cos squared. times the derivative of sine cubed. So it's sort of like the same idea here. And let's see if we can, where the u would be sine this time. So if that became, you know, so that's 3, that would be 3, except it would be 3 u squared this time, and then u prime. So 3u squared for u cubed would be 3 sine squared. And then the derivative of u in this case, which is the derivative of sine, would just be positive cosine. So all I did was kind of clean this up a little bit. Sine times sine cubed is sine fourth, which put the negative in front so I could lose the parentheses. And then I have a cos squared times cos here, which makes cosine cubed. Okay, so there we go. Yeah, trig derivatives can be a will be a challenge because sometimes, you know, the, the, the argument of the function is the what your is the chain rule part of it, and sometimes the function itself, like where it's just cosine raised to a power, versus that example I was saying verbally a minute ago with sine of 10x. In that case, the u would be 10x. Be like you had like this, y equals sine u. And the derivative is cos u, u prime. So if that was 10x, the derivative of 10x would be 10. Tan of t to the 6. Now the way you can tell the difference here, you know, always important in trig functions, do you know if the, if the trig function is to the power, the arguments to the power? Well in this case, if it was tangent to the 6, the 6 would either have to be, well, the 6 would be right there next to the n on tangent, or it would have been like this, raised to the 6, then that would have meant tangents raised to the 6. Here it's the tangent of t to the 6. So if there were going to be parentheses in this problem, I'll go very fine, fine point here. It would have been right around the t to the 6 like that. So that notation then implies this. It implies the parentheses is around the t to the 6. So basically you're taking the derivative. That's weird, dx dt. That's okay. Something a little different. So the u is, is t to the 6. So derivative of tan u would be sec squared u u prime. So the first thing we have is sec squared of t to the 6, which maybe I could have put parentheses around there, but I didn't, times the derivative of t to the 6. So it's sec squared u, u prime. So then the derivative of t to the 6, of course, would be 6t to the 5th. I went ahead and just toss that out in front because I find that it looks better if you put it in that part in front of the trig function. So there you go. So derivative tan of u is sec squared u, u prime. So here you go. Here's what I'm talking about. Now we know that the trig function itself is raised to the power. These next couple are what I call, they sort of have a double chain rule effect. That's not an official mathematical term, but you're going to have to, you know, consider that you've got the derivative of secant being to the 6, and you're also going to have to take the derivative of 3t into consideration. But the first thing you do is look at this as u being all that, sec of 3t. And so the derivative of u to the 6 is 6 u to the 5 u prime. So for sure I've got 6 sec 3t to the 5th times the derivative of sec 3 to the t. So here's what I was talking about being like a double chain rule. You're kind of, that's the first chain rule. But now you're looking at this part here on the right as sec u. Now you sort of have a new u basically. In my notes, you look at the ones I did, I used different letters there. To, so I didn't want to use U every time. I might have used like W or something like that. But now, the derivative of sec of U is sec U tan U U prime. 
So I put the, I did this first. I took the derivative of 3t. Can you see how I did that up here? Where I ended up putting the derivative of 6t in front anyway. So I went ahead and just at the end, so I just did it first. So that 3 in front here comes from the derivative of 3t, which would be 3. And then there's the cq tan u at the end right there. So I went ahead and put it in front. And just for grins, I kind of combined this up a little bit because it wasn't that difficult. 6 times 3, 18, no big deal. But a seek fifth times a seek to the first gives you a seek six. So I just kind of cleaned up the like terms a little bit. And the last one is another one similar to that. We have to write 1 plus cos of 3t to the 1 half, which would be Basically, you're looking at it as u to the one half as the first step. So the derivative of u to the one half is one half times u to the negative one half times u prime. So the one half comes down. This stays the same for now. Subtract one from the exponents, negative one half. And then now I've got to focus on the derivative of one plus cotangent of three t. Okay, just coincidental the argument was three t again. All right, but so that derivative of 3t would be 3, but this is where we have to know that the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. Obviously, the derivative of 1 is 0. So the derivative of cotangent of 3t is negative 3 cosecant squared 3t. So see, remembering to take, see, a lot of people might have got the negative cosecant squared of 3t, but you'd be surprised how many times people will forget that 3. All about that chain rule. So it looks like I just kind of took the 3, negative 3, and the 1. Well, actually, I didn't merge them together. I sort of did, but I left the 2 on bottom. I could have put negative 3 halves on top. That would have been fine. So I dropped that negative 1 half down to the bottom. There's your cosecant squared on top. And I believe that does it. So best of luck to you on this exam.